On December 11, 2022, NASA's Orion spacecraft made a safe return to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down in the Pacific Ocean, successfully concluding the uncrewed Artemis I mission. Not long after, a Navy team aboard the USS Portland carried out the capsule's recovery, bringing it onto the ship's well deck. The entire operation took about two hours, marking NASA's first attempt at recovering an Orion spacecraft after an orbital mission. Meanwhile, SpaceX has been routinely recovering its Dragon capsules from orbital missions for years. And get this, it usually takes them just 60 minutes or less, cutting NASA's time in half. But this isn't just about mission type. The key difference lies in the approach. SpaceX embraces a modern, streamlined recovery process focused on speed and cost efficiency, whereas NASA continues to rely on a more traditional method. So how does SpaceX take NASA's decades of experience and leap ahead with their own innovative spin? Let's dive into that and more in today's episode of TechMap. SpaceX may have taken a few pages out of NASA's playbook when it comes to vehicle recovery, but it's how they adapted and evolved the process that truly sets them apart. Let's start with NASA. Before their Orion spacecraft makes a splashdown, the agency deploys a Navy amphibious ship to the site. These ships feature a large open area at the waterline called a well deck, where smaller recovery boats can maneuver alongside. Depending on weather and sea conditions, astronauts can be extracted either directly from the water or from within the ship's well deck. If recovery happens inside the well deck, a specialized stand is used to safely assist the astronauts once the spacecraft is on board. Once Orion is in the ocean, a team of divers and recovery experts sets out in small boats. They secure the spacecraft and use winches and cables to haul it into the well deck. The deck is then closed and drained, creating a stable, dry space to transport the capsule and its crew back to land. It's a reliable process, tried, tested, and very NASA. Enter SpaceX. They took inspiration from NASA's methods but added their own twist. The company acquired a former offshore supply ship, originally built between 2009 and 2010 in Alabama, to support the recovery of their Crew Dragon capsule. This vessel went through several names and owners before being acquired by Geiss Offshore in 2014 and rebranded as MVGO Searcher. In 2016, SpaceX chartered Go Searcher to recover payload fairings from their Falcon 9 launches. The plan? Use parachutes and parafoils to slow the descent of the fairings, catch them at sea, and reuse them to save on production costs. The first few missions didn't go as planned. It wasn't until the fourth attempt, during the SES-10 mission, that they managed to haul back large chunks of fairing debris, although not intact fairings. Clearly, there were issues, either with steering the parafoils or with damage upon ocean impact. Afterwards, they repurposed Go Searcher for Crew Dragon recovery, modifying it with a capsule crane, a helipad, medical facilities, and cutting-edge tech to support both cargo and crewed missions. The ship played a major role in the Demo-1 mission in March 2019 and helped recover the capsule during the dramatic in-flight abort test in 2020. These missions paved the way for human spaceflight's return to U.S. soil with Demo-2 in May 2020. From that point on, the ship, renamed Megan in honor of astronaut Megan MacArthur, became the go-to vessel for Crew Dragon and Cargo Dragon recoveries. Over its career, it safely brought back 24 astronauts, including participants in the first all-commercial and private astronaut missions. But like any seasoned veteran, Megan's time eventually came to an end. During the historic Crew-9 mission, in which two stranded NASA astronauts were brought home, Megan completed its final assignment on the East Coast. Fittingly, this marked the last Dragon splashdown in those waters before recovery operations shifted westward. Megan then sailed to Louisiana in mid-June 2025 for retirement. This wasn't just about nostalgia, it was a strategic move. 
Older ships like Megan come with higher maintenance costs. SpaceX, known for optimizing everything, is now turning to newer recovery vessels like MV Shannon. It's all part of the company's mission to lower launch costs by up to 30% through innovation, reusability, and smart logistics. SpaceX didn't just copy NASA, they took the blueprint, reimagined it, and arguably outperformed their mentors. Let's talk about Dragon's recovery process, which just takes half of NASA's time. SpaceX's approach involves lightning-fast crew extraction, backed by Air Force rescue teams and a tightly coordinated multi-step process using small boats, a recovery ship, and even a helicopter. Right after the Dragon capsule splashes down, fast boats rush to the site. Their first priority? Safety checks looking for hazardous fuel, and confirming the astronaut's condition. Once everything's clear, they secure the capsule with cables and use cranes on recovery ships like Megan to lift it on board. Unlike NASA's Orion, which is brought into a ship's well deck, Dragon stays on the open deck. While the Dragon's hoisted aboard, recovery teams also retrieve parachutes floating in the sea. Once the Dragon's safely on deck, astronauts are helped out of the capsule and immediately taken to a medical area for checks. A helicopter is then used to fly them back to land, quickly and efficiently. For cargo-only missions, the helicopter is also used to return important science payloads or gear to the Kennedy Space Center as fast as possible. NASA's commercial crew program requires SpaceX to get astronauts out of Dragon within 60 minutes of splashdown. By comparison, NASA's own Orion recovery process can take up to two hours. How does SpaceX pull it off? By designing both the spacecraft and operations around speed and simplicity. Crew Dragon features a large side hatch that swings outward for a wide clear exit. It uses a quick release mechanism, so recovery teams can open it almost immediately after splashdown. It's placed so astronauts can step right onto a recovery platform or into a raft, ideal for people who've just spent time in microgravity. In emergencies, astronauts can even get out on their own, thanks to the roomy interior and the way controls and seats are laid out for fast movement. On board the recovery ships, immediate medical support is always ready. Ships like Megan are outfitted with medical treatment units and trained personnel dedicated spaces for quick health checks and emergency care, helipads for fast medevac if needed. The ship's crane lifts the capsule right onto the deck so doctors can assess the crew on the spot, no delays. And with operations near the coast, astronauts are never far from full-scale hospital care. Now contrast that with NASA's Orion. It's a bigger, heavier capsule, so pulling it from the ocean is more of a challenge. Recovery requires massive ships, cranes, and a full Navy team. It also usually lands farther offshore in open waters, meaning it takes longer for recovery crews to reach it, secure it, and help astronauts out. Orion's interior layout and size can make egress harder, especially after long missions in deep space. Astronauts might be more affected by microgravity and need extra help. As mentioned, Orion was brought to the deck, so immediate medical assistance was almost impossible. We have to wait until the deck is closed and drained. Unlike SpaceX's vessels with built-in medical facilities, Orion's recovery depends on Navy assets and helicopters, which may take longer to provide full medical attention. In short, SpaceX's commercial model lets them optimize for speed and cost. Their ships, like Megan, are custom-built for quick recovery and crew support. NASA, on the other hand, sticks to more traditional methods, effective but slower and more resource-heavy. So which would you choose? The commercial path focused on speed and reusability, or the traditional aerospace route that prioritizes thoroughness? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. Anyway, if you love this deep dive, smash that like button, hit subscribe, and ring the bell. We're aiming for 150,000 subscribers, and we need you to get there. Check out our other videos on Starship, Artemis, and more. And let's keep exploring the cosmos together. 
Orbital missions usually involve highly complex recovery procedures, mainly due to the unpredictable landing scenarios, the critical need to ensure astronaut safety at all times, and the tough challenges of re-entering Earth's atmosphere from space. On the other hand, suborbital missions, like Blue Origin's New Shepard, are much simpler to recover. This is largely because the flights are shorter and don't go as high. New Shepard only flies for about 10 to 12 minutes, just crossing the Karman line around 100 kilometers above Earth without actually going into orbit. That means it comes back down in a very controlled and predictable way, usually landing near its launch site in West Texas. What also helps is that the rocket booster lands itself vertically on a pad while the crew capsule floats back down under parachutes. That makes it easy to plan and control exactly where everything lands. Since the capsule comes down on solid ground or close to shore, a small team nearby can quickly reach it, help the passengers, and secure the capsule. There's no need for big ships or aircraft to fish it out of the ocean. The capsule is built so passengers can exit quickly once it's on the ground. Plus, they only experience a few minutes of weightlessness, so they're not dealing with the effects of long-term space travel, making the recovery even smoother. New Shepard is designed to be reused with minimal maintenance. That means once it lands, it's easy to turn it around for the next launch without a huge recovery operation. And New Shepard's 13th crewed mission is one of those missions. On June 29th, Blue Origin sent its 70th person into space, lifting off at 9.39 a.m. CDT from its launch site 1 in West Texas. On board were husband and wife Ali and Carl Quenner, Leland Larson, Freddie Rossigno Jr., Owalabi Salas, and James Sitkin. Carl Quenner became Blue Origin's astronaut number 70, which, based on prior precedent, was determined by the seat on board the New Shepard capsule that he assigned for the flight. He also became the 750th person in history to reach space, as recorded by the Association of Space Explorers Registry of Space Travelers. The 10-minute NS-33 mission, numbered such as this was Blue Origin's 33rd New Shepard flight overall, went to plan with both the propulsion module, Tail 5, making a safe vertical landing and the crew capsule, named RSS Karman Line, returning the passengers to a parachute-slowed, air-thruster-cushioned touchdown, not far from where they launched. For about three minutes as the gumdrop-shaped capsule reached its apogee, or highest point away from Earth, the Quainers, Larson, Rishigno, Salas, and Sitkin, experienced weightlessness and saw the curvature of the planet set against the stark blackness of space. The flight reached a 345,044 feet, 105.2 kilometers, above the ground, surpassing the Karman line, the internationally accepted boundary between Earth and space at 62 miles high, 100 kilometers.